Okay, so the question is uh, solve. The question is uh, solve uh, two cosine squared x equals to one. Yep. Uh, what I would do, I would say that cosine squared x is half, and then cosine x then would be either either 1 over root 2 or cosine x would be negative 1 over root 2. Uh, this is what you obtain by taking uh, well I mean if, I, if, if the square of a number is half then that number has to be uh, plus or minus root of half right now uh, I am going to uh, I'm going to rewrite this as uh, root two over two, right? Or cosine x is negative root two over two. Now um, we know exactly, so we need to find the values of x. Uh, we need to find angles between 0 and 2 pi for which cosine is uh, half or negative, sorry, uh, root 2 over 2 or negative root 2 over 2. So if you remember the uh, circle uh, that I provided with coordinates uh, in that circle, um, Uh, if uh, if this area here is 45 degree, right, uh, then the coordinates of this point are given by what? Root 2 over 2, root 2 over 2. If this angle is pi over 4, right? And so um, if you look at this point here, which is directly across from y-axis at it, the same distance uh, as this point. So this would be uh, negative root 2 over 2, comma root 2 over 2. You guys are okay with that? And then um, if I look at the point which is directly below this point, directly below this point right here, and the, the point directly below this one, um, this would be negative root 2 over 2, negative root 2 over 2. This would be positive root 2 over 2, negative root 2 over 2, right? And so what are these angles? So um, th this would be 5 pi over 4 here, right? This would be 7 pi over 4. And this one would be 3 pi over 4. So we see that uh, cosine x is positive root 2 over 2 whenever uh, x would be pi over 4 or 7 pi over 4, right? And it's negative root 2 over 2 when it is 3 pi over 4 or 5 pi over 4. So now we know that x has to be uh, either, uh, either pi over 4 or um, 7 pi over 4 or x is, when, when cosine x is negative root 2 over 2, I get x to be what? 3 pi over 4. Uh, and uh, 5 pi over 4.
So those are the uh, solutions. Now, if, if it says find all the solutions, you just add a multiple of 2 pi. So basically, for with each answer that you have right now, you add a multiple of 2 pi, like 2 n pi. Just add 2 n pi. Is that okay? All right. So, okay, so any other questions? We'll see, then it also had mm -hmm. 4 pi over 4 plus n over 2 pi. That's why, that's what I didn't get. Uh, you're talking about the final answer? Yeah. Where's the, uh, where's that at? Oh, okay. Um, Cause I got, I got exactly what you did, but. I didn't, I didn't understand that last Oh, what they, okay, uh, don't worry about what they said all, okay? okay. What it means, uh, okay, what they are saying is that the, the, the four answers that you have here, that's equivalent to this. Oh. Uh, and the way you realize that is that, you see, if you, so they, what, they, what are they doing? They are actually uh, adding a multiple of 90 degree pi over two. So what do you, uh, okay, so, um, so right now what you have is that, uh, is this, this answer, right? Yeah. Um, a and, well, the answer, the final answer is you add 2 and pi, right? So the, the right. x would be, x would be pi over 4 plus 2 and pi, or uh, 3 pi over 4 plus 2 and pi or uh, 5 pi over 4 plus 2 and pi or uh, 7 pi over 4 plus 2 and pi so now uh, you can write so for every value of n you, every integer value of n, you get a solution. Now, all these solutions, uh, they are equivalent to writing x in the following way. So I can write x as pi over 4 plus a multiple of pi over 2. Notice that if I pick, uh, if I pick uh, n, to be an even integer, like if, if I replace n by 2n, right, I get the first, right, and then if you replace uh, n by, uh, let's see, if you replace n by 2n plus 1, then you're going to get 3 pi over 4. You realize that? Replace n by, you, if you replace n by 2n plus 1, you're going to get 3 pi over 4 plus 2 n pi. And you can, you can get the other ones in a similar way. So the point is, you can write just one answer. You can just write this answer instead of writing all of it. So these are equivalent. So you don't have to worry about, worry about that. Yeah. This was not an additional solution. It's just that general, uh, it's just that another form of the general solution. Okay, any other questions? Okay, 22, uh, can you tell me what that is? Tangent x is the same as root of 3. Okay, um, so uh, first thing you want to realize is that, remember I said, you have the four quadrants, one, two, three, four. In the first quadrant, the values of all trig functions are positive, right? In the, if you have an angle, uh, if you have an angle in the first quadrant, the values of all trig functions would be positive. Now, now for tangent, uh, for tangent, tangent is only positive when the angle is either on the in the uh, first quadrant or the third quadrant, right? It's going to be negative in the second and fourth. So I know that the uh, terminal side of x is either in the first quadrant or in the third quadrant, right? 
So can, can someone tell, give me an, a, a value of x? So remember, tangent means what? Tangent means sine x over <coughs> cosine x, which is uh, root 3. Uh, so it's just root 3. Um, now, I am looking for an angle x. So can someone give me an angle in the first quadrant? Uh, where sine x over cosine x would be root 3, yeah? It's pi over 3 because, okay, so the reason is, um, you know, sine, so what is sine, what is sine pi over 3? That's 60 degrees, oops, that's uh, 60 degrees, right? So that's root 3 over 2. And then what is cosine pi over 3? We, we computed those values, right? I showed you how to get those values and then I gave you the circle. And cosine pi over 3 is half, right? So if I take the ratio of sine uh, pi over 3 and cosine pi over 3, what do you get? Root 3 over 2. So look at your circle, you'll see that you're basically taking the ratio of the second coordinate with the first coordinate and see if you get root 3. Okay? And, and this is root 3. So I know that at one of the values of x would be pi over 3. It would be pi over 3. And that's the only angle in the first quadrant where you're going to get, uh, get uh, tangent x to be root 3. Oh, because I have, I, I remember the circle, right? I, I, because I, I remember I computed the values of sine pi over 3, cosine pi over 3 before, right? If you look at the circle and the coordinates that I gave you, you want tangent to be root 3, and you know that tangent is the ratio of sine and cosine, right? So you basically divide the second coordinate by the first coordinate and see if you get root 3. So for each of the points you have, you look at the ratio of the first, sorry, second coordinate with the uh, uh, first coordinate, and then uh, you want to see if you get root 3, and you'll see that for pi over 3, if you take the ratio of the two coordinates, you'll get root 3, right? So, does that, does that make sense? Now, there is another angle in the third quadrant. What is that? Yeah. So, uh, uh, x could x could as well be 4 pi over 3. The reason is, at 4 pi over 3, you'll see that the sine value is what? Negative root 3 over 2, right? And cosine value is negative half, right? So if you take the ratio, you still get positive root 2. So these are the two angles where ten, uh, tangent x is root 3. Okay? And then, uh, again, you, you add 2 and pi, if the question says find all the all the solutions, right? So I would be adding, I would be writing x to be pi over three plus two and pi, uh, and four pi over three plus two and pi. Uh, everybody is uh, okay with that. And again, even in this case, even in this case, you can sort of uh, rewrite in one single form instead of two different forms. So for example, 4 pi over 3, right? That's the same as pi plus pi over 3, right? So this guy I can rewrite as pi plus pi over 3 plus 2n pi, right? And notice that uh, this would be then pi over 3 plus 2n pi and pi. If I add them, I get what? 2n plus 1 pi, right? Okay, you don't have to do this, but I'm saying, uh, now, you see here n is even, right? Sorry, here 2n is even, here 2n plus 1 is odd. So together, both answers can be written together as uh, pi over 3 plus n pi. Okay, instead of 2n pi. Put together, but you don't have to do it, okay? Just, just write two answers, that's fine. Is everybody okay with that? You don't have to uh, write one, you don't have to simplify the answer to one answer. This is a little bit more work. So 
Just keep two answers. Is that making sense? Okay, any other questions? Twenty-nine. Go ahead. Cosine two x minus sine x. Cosine two x minus sine x is one. Yeah. Uh, this is a little bit difficult uh, uh, to solve. What you have to do is the following. Uh, I am going to convert the cosine 2x into uh, sine x. How would I do it though? Remember for cosine 2x I gave you a, uh, I gave you a formula, right? Which is cosine 2x is cosine squared x minus sine squared x. Right, remember that? I gave you this formula for cosine. It's a double angle form. So you look, look, at, look into your uh, trig cheat sheet that I gave you. You'll see that uh, uh, under the double angle formulas, you'll find that. Now, cosine squared. Uh, cosine squared, isn't that the same as 1 minus sine squared? Minus sine squared x minus sine x. You guys agree with that? Uh, remember cosine, how do I know cosine squared plus sine squared is 1, so I can say cosine squared is 1 minus sine squared, right? Everybody's okay with that? Uh, let me write that down here. So I'm saying uh, cosine squared plus sine squared x is equal to 1, so then cosine squared x would be 1 minus sine squared x. So that's what I'm using here. Now uh, you have to simplify now. Uh, what I have now is uh, notice that I can combine that there are two sine squared now, right? And they, they will combine to what? Negative 2 sine squared x. I have a negative sine x. Uh, I have a 1 on the left, right? I have a 1 on the left, I have 1 on the right. Is that okay with everybody? Okay. Say it again. Oh, because you have negative sine squared x, negative sine squared of x, right? So there are two ne negative sine squared, sine squared of x. All right, so now I'm going to rewrite this as negative 2 sine squared x minus sine x. Can I cancel out the one? Okay. Uh, uh, what I'm going to do next is multi uh, mu uh, multiply both sides by negative one. So what do I get? 2 uh, sine squared x plus sine x is 0. Next, uh, I am uh, notice that I can factor out sine x, right? Factor out sine x. So I get two sine x plus one equals to zero. Okay. Uh, so then I can say what sine x is zero, right? Or two sine x plus 1 is 0, right? In other words, sine x is 0. Or, uh, here I get 2 sine x is what? Negative 1. And then I get sine x is 0. Or, sine x is negative half. Okay, because first of all, let's solve sine x is 0. Sine x, uh, the sine function is zero for what angles? Just two pi and pi. So uh, remember, sine sine value is given by on the unit circle. 
the sign value uh, is given by the second coordinates, second coordinate of the points, right? And the second coordinate is zero whenever the angle is on the x-axis, right? Positive x-axis or negative x-axis. So whenever the terminal side is on the positive x-axis or the negative x-axis, sine would be zero, right? Well, what are those angles? Zero, pi, two pi, okay? So x would be zero, pi, two pi. In fact, at any multiple of pi, right? At any multiple of pi, sine would be zero. Okay, in fact, so I can, I can write this as x is a multiple of pi. Any multiple of pi you have, the terminal side would be on the positive x-axis or the negative x-axis. Now, well, how about sine x is negative half? Well, look into the circle that I gave you with the points. Uh, uh, when is the second coordinate negative half? Uh-huh, is that the only one? There is another one, right? 7 pi over 6. So x is 7 pi over 6, 11 pi over 6. And you can, uh, well, if you have to, you can add a multiple of 2 pi again, right? 2 and pi. Uh, everybody, so I, I would just uh, this leave my answer right here. Okay. okay. Yeah. So there was a quite a bit of algebra here before you got to the. Yeah. Okay. Uh, how can you use the formula? Like, how do you do the formula? Well, uh, see, I see cosine 2x right away. I, I tell myself that I don't know what to do, but I know there is a formula for cosine 2x. I'm going to apply them and see if anything happens. So as a student, when you do a problem like this for the first time, you know, whenever you see a cosine of 2x, that, you know, if, if you don't see anything else to do, well, use the formula for cosine 2x, see what happens. So now, once you apply that, you get this, okay? And then I said, tell myself, how do I solve when you have a mixture of sine and cosine? Well, let's try to convert everything to sine and see what happens. So I convert to sine here, okay? Um, and in order to convert cosine squared to sine squared, you just apply, apply this one. Yeah, it should be there somewhere. I'm not sure exactly which. It's, the, it's cosine squared theta plus sine squared theta you want. And it's written in that form. Uh, again, uh, you know, when you do it, a problem like this for the first time, it's very, it, it, it usually you, you get stuck because you don't have enough experience. You see, uh, that's why it's important to be able to remember this formula because if you didn't remember the, uh, the, the formula, for, if you don't know that there is a formula for cosine to x, you know, you would have no clue to go from here to here. And then, if you didn't have this formula in your head, then you wouldn't be able it, I mean, first of all, you have to be able to think about which formula to apply, right? Uh, and you have to know that there is a formula which converts cosine to sine, right? Uh, if you don't remember exactly what that formula, that's fine, but you have to at least remember that there is a formula to convert cosine squared to sine squared. Right? Otherwise, you, you wouldn't be able to go, you won't be able to go from here to here. Okay. And again, when you get stuck with these type of problems, you know, you should feel bad. That's what happens when you learn something for the first time. But once you know how to do it, do it a couple of times so that you remember. Remember how, how to do this problem. Okay. And then if you see a similar problem later on in your life, you, you know what to do. It's all about experience of doing the problems. The more problems you do, the more experience you have. Uh, and then later on, if you do a different problem, you still have so much experience that you can type them better. So I remember when I was in 10th um, grade, 10th grade or 9th grade, I can't remember, 9th grade or 10th grade. 
uh, my, my, uh, my teacher, a trick, trick teacher, he made us do every single exercise uh, problems, uh, I think three or five times or something, and we had to submit every single problem five times. Okay? And, and the reason he did that, he just wanted to make sure that we did it over and over again until it becomes very you know, easy for you to, to, to go over it. Uh, in any case, um, uh, uh, that's the solution. Any other questions? Okay, don't, don't be discouraged by hard, a little bit hard problems like this. If you do it twice or three times, you'll see that it, it will become easier. Any other? All right, so uh, I am going to be starting to talk about real numbers now. Real numbers. Okay, so what are uh, real numbers? First of all, uh, I am going to use the symbol n, like this, uh, to denote uh, the collection of natural numbers or counting numbers. Um, so these are the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, dot, dot, dot. So these are, these are the so-called natural numbers. I don't know why it is called natural numbers, but it's some people will say counting numbers. Okay, natural numbers. And then uh, the next set of numbers is the, will be denoted by uh, Z. And um, the uh, now these are the uh, these are the natural numbers counting numbers together with their negatives and zero okay so this is b dot 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 negative two negative one zero one two three dot 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 so these are the called the integers okay integers so z denotes the collection of integers okay. Um, okay, so what's the, uh, notice that uh, integers, they include the natural numbers, right? Integers include natural numbers. Uh, okay, so next set of uh, numbers would be denoted by Q. And it's not possible to write, write out the numbers the way I did for N and Z. Here I'm going to say this is the collection of ratios, collection of ratios where uh, the numerator uh, and the denominator they are both integers and the denominator is not zero. So take the ratio of all, take all possible ratios of integers uh, except that you cannot pick denominator to be zero uh, all these ratios are called uh, rational numbers, okay? Uh, can someone tell me, so for example, what are, these are called rational numbers. Rational numbers. Uh, for example, what are rational numbers? Well, uh, you know, half, negative, three half, uh, four, third, uh, you name it. Fractions, yeah, it's ratios, fractions uh, uh, of integers. Now, uh, uh, can someone tell me if Q includes Z? Are the integers inside the rationals? Yeah. Yeah, so if I have the number four, right, I can think of the four as the ratio of four and one. If I have the number negative three, I can think of that as negative three, uh, three over one, right? So uh, the integers, they are included in the collection of rational numbers, okay? All right, uh, everybody's clear so far? All right, 
Now, oh, yeah. Go ahead and write that down. If you're done, let me know. Just one more bigger collection of numbers that will be called the real numbers. Um, okay, so uh, the next collection, uh, before I get there, notice that, uh, I mean, imagine that uh, you are you know, you are you are a student at at the uh, school that Pythagoras used to run. Okay, so they he has his uh, uh, triangle. That uh, where is that? Um, so let's say I have a right triangle. Um, and you know, Pythagoras let's say has proved the uh, Pythagoras Pythagorean theorem for you. And then you are a nerd, and you have nothing better to do in your life, so you just play around with this new thing that you learned, okay? So, and say you said, hey, what if I pick one side to be one, the other si another side to be one, then they, what's the length of the hypotenuse, right? Well, the, let's say the hypotenuse has length x, then I know that x squared would be what? One squared plus one squared, and then x squared would be two, okay? Now you have to understand, at that point, people didn't know anything about numbers besides rationals, okay? So rationals were the numbers, okay? Uh, you cannot have any, not any so they did say, so they said, uh, you know, the rationals are the only numbers, okay? There are no other numbers, but, uh, then and then someone like someone's a student said, "Well, I have x squared is two. So what is that? Okay. So that means there is a number such that whose square is two, right? Uh, but it turns out that the number x whose square uh, square uh, whose square is two uh, is not a rational number. Okay. So uh, so so x would be root two. What? So we denote x by root 2, right? We denote, so what is root 2? Root 2 is a positive number. Root 2 represents a positive number whose square is 2. However, root 2 is not rational, okay? Root 2 is not rational. What does it mean? It means that it means that I cannot write root 2 as a ratio of two integers, right? You cannot write root 2 as a ratio of two integers. And then they proved it. Whoever said, let's say you had, it didn't have much time, so you proved that uh, root 2 is not rational. So what is that? Well, they started to call them lengths, okay? Because they were afraid of calling, calling it a number at that time. So... But, um, what do we call uh, a number like root 2? Root 2 is called what? It's called an irrational, right? Talk about being uh, creative about names, right? Rational and irrational. Root 2 is an irrational number. Um, irrational doesn't refer to irrational person. <laughs> it, it, it refers to the fact that it's not a rational number. It's not the ratio of two integers. Uh, everybody is okay with that? Now, I can prove for you root 2 is not rational, uh, but I, I don't, I don't want to spend the class time on it. If you want to see that, you can talk to me later. Uh, but I, I hope that you can believe me that root 2 cannot be written as the ratio of two integers. Now, can you give me other examples of irrational numbers? Root of 3. How about pi? Pi. So these are, these are other examples of, you, if you take 4th root of 3, for example, you get another one. So there, are, so there are numbers which are not rational, right? There are numbers which are not rational. And and so, what are the real numbers? I'm going to denote by R. That's called the collection of real numbers. 
real numbers. This is the, I should say, set of real numbers. So what is the set of real numbers? The set of real numbers, well, you put together the collection of rational numbers, the collection of rational numbers, you put it together with the collection of irrational numbers, okay? Okay, so you, you put together the collection of rational numbers together with the irrational numbers. You put, put them in one collection. That's what the meaning of U is. U means you're putting them in one collection. Uh, that's the uh, collection of real numbers, okay? And notice that, notice that the collection of natural numbers, that's contained in the collection of integers. The collection of integers is contained in the collection of rational numbers and the collection of rational numbers is contained in the collection of real numbers. And you can also say the collection of real numbers is contained in the collection of complex numbers, but in this course uh, we don't worry about complex numbers. We only work with real numbers. Yeah. Uh, the meaning of this symbol is, uh, it, is, it means contained in, okay? Contained in. And the, this U symbol here, it means union. It means that you are putting two collections together in one collection. Okay. Is everybody okay with that? Now, one, of, one question that you need to ask hey, is, uh, hey, how many real numbers are there? Of course, there are infinitely many, but uh, uh, you know, so is the co collection of natural numbers. Right? The collection of natural numbers, that there are infinitely many na uh, natural numbers, uh, but uh, you know, how many, how many uh, number, real numbers do you have? How do you quantify that? Okay? And uh, so let's recall the number line. The, let's say I have, I have, this is the number line. So number line means what? So this is the real, real number, real number line. What is the real number line? Well, you take a straight line, you pick one point to represent the number zero, pick one point to represent the number zero, then pick a scale, pick a unique length. So let's say the unique length, I am picking the scale to be here. So this is one, this is two, this is three, dot, 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 and then negative, negative uh, integers would be like here, right here, negative one, negative two, negative three, dot, dot, dot. So I pick a unique length, then then I, I, uh, I pick points accordingly to represent the integers, okay? Now once I pick uh, points for, uh, for integers, then what, what, which point will represent half? Well, this point here will represent half, right? The point in the middle between 0 and 1, halfway through between 0 and 1. Uh, which point will represent um, uh, 1 quarter? Well, right here, right? That would be uh, one quarter. Everybody's okay? So every single, you can represent all the rationals in this way. Right? Every point, uh, there are points where they, they represent rationals, okay? So if you ask me how many real numbers are there, well, as many points you have on the line. So there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between, uh, so one-to-one, one-to-one, uh, one correspondence correspondence between the collection of real numbers and points points on the on the line what do i mean by that Every single point on the line represents a real number. Every single real number is represented by some, some point. 
So there is a one to one. So if, if you line up, line up the real numbers one by one, line up the points on the line, there is a one to one correspondence between the two. So how many real numbers are there? Just as many points you have on the line. Is everybody okay with that? All right. Uh, so that's what we mean by uh, real numbers, but uh, there are some other things that we need to know. Uh, we use, uh, uh, we use uh, decimal expansions to represent uh, real numbers, right? So uh, it, uh, what do we know about decimal expansions of rational numbers, okay? Um, the, so let me write it as the remark. Recall that the decimal decimal expansion decimal expansions uh, expansions of rational numbers. are either are either uh, terminating either terminating or repeating what do I mean by that I mean uh, if you have the number uh, 3.25 is that terminating it means you have finitely many digits okay on the other hand if I have a number like 4.171717 dot 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 it means that one seven repeats right infinitely often right so that's a I have in the second number I have infinitely many uh, digits but the one seven is repeating okay so anytime you have decimal expansions wh which is terminating or repeating, it's a rational number. You might say, what? You can write that as the uh, ratio of two integers? You think that's, that's the case? How would you write 3.25 as the ratio of two integers? I'm pretty sure you know it. Three, 325 divided by 100, right? Right? So this is a ratio of two integers. How about 4.17? Uh, let's, let's take, uh, let's take uh, M to be 4.171717 dot dot dot. Okay. I, I want to show to you that M is the ratio of two integers, right? What I'm going to do is multiply M by 100. What do I get if I multiply by 100? 417.1717, right? Da, da, da. You guys agree with that? All right, so now subtract. What is 100M minus M? Can someone tell me that? What is that? Yeah, on the left-hand side, I'm going to get 99M, but I'm saying what is... Uh, if you're subtracting 100 M minus M, you're going to be subtracting 417.17 minus 4.17, right? So what is that? Well, four, from 417, you're going to subtract 4, right? So that's 413. And then notice that everything after the decimal point will disappear, right? When you subtract, right? So then I get 413. So then what is M? 413 over 99, right? So this is a ratio of integers, right? All right, so that's why I said if it is repeating, it is a ratio of two integers, okay? Now, how about decimal expansions of uh, irrational numbers? What happens with that? Decimal... Uh, expansions of irrational numbers are neither 
uh, terminating no repeating we just saw if it is terminating or repeating it's got to be a irrational number so irrational numbers cannot be one of those right so if you if you uh, look at the number pi uh, uh, it's not it's the the decimal expansion of pi 3.14 blah 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 um, uh, it's not it's not repeating or it's not uh, terminating if you do were then you know you know there are people uh, who who we say that they have very good memory when they say that they can they can tell you the uh, first 50 or 100 digits of uh, of the number pi right we think that they have a good memory right if, if it was repeating then who cares right <laughs> everybody can remember that so um, so that's the case okay so that's all I have to say about real numbers so I think that that's a pretty good uh, review of this um, oh, uh, so na the next thing that I want to talk about would be uh, intervals. We already, I already talked about this a little bit, but I want to make sure that everybody remembers interval notation. Interval notation. Um, if I have uh, if I have a real number A, okay, and, and a real number B, so I have, uh, if I have the, um, uh, if I write this symbol, right, A comma B in brackets, uh, this represents what? This represents all real number which are between the numbers A and B. So here I'm taking A, B to be real numbers, okay? A and B are two fixed real numbers. Then the uh, this symbol represents all real numbers between what? All real numbers x between A and B, including A and B, right? Uh, what is represented by what is represented by A B uh, like this? Well. It's the collection of all real numbers strictly between A and B, excluding A and B, right? A and B are not included. So uh, the second, well, second interval from A to B represents all real numbers between A and B with, uh, without including A and B, right? Uh, okay, so can, can someone tell me what this is? A, B, but I have bracket here. So this would be what? All real numbers x between A and? Including B. Right? And uh, then I can also talk about A to B like this, which would be A less than or equal to x less than B. All real numbers x between A and B, including A, excluding B, right? Um, uh, how about a to infinity what does what does that mean it means all real numbers x which is greater than or equal to what a uh, what is this negative infinity to b uh, say it again yeah negative infinity to b is that it's the collection of all real numbers less than or equal to b um, there is an, uh, here's another one a to infinity uh, that would be x larger than a right and then another one here negative infinity to b that is uh, x less than b right and how about negative infinity to negative infinity it represents all real numbers, right? It represents all real numbers. Everybody's okay. So that's the interval notation. Okay. Uh, let's see, what's the next topic?
Okay, any questions on on what we did so far? Everybody's okay? All right, so uh, the next topic, everybody is done writing this? Okay. Uh, the next topic is, uh, the next topic is uh, functions. So we will be talking about functions now, which is uh, section 1.1 in your text. Okay. Now chapter 1 in your text, I still call that pre-calculus because uh, the materials in uh, chapter 1 is pretty much what you have seen in pre-calculus as well. So yeah, I'm pretty sure you have seen functions when you took uh, pre-calculus. Okay. Um, so that's what, uh, that's what I want to start with. Uh, so we'll be talking about functions now. So functions. Well, uh, what are functions? Um, let me first give you examples of functions in applications. Um, so if I, if, I, if I look at the area of a circle, right? Area of a circle. Uh, it has a relationship. The area of a circle uh, depends on the radius of the circle, right? The area of a circle depends on the radius of a circle. Um, suppose that you have an object which is moving. An object which is moving and you're studying the motion of that object. Uh, then you have the position, position of a moving object, of a moving uh, object, and it is uh, it is related to or it ha uh, it has a relationship with what time? Okay, the position of an object and time. Um, so I have a relationship between position and time. Uh, same way the velocity velocity of a moving object and time and um, and just to, just just to give you one more example um, so uh, restoring restoring force uh, of a spring and uh, the stretch the stretch of the spring uh, what do I mean by that I imagine that you have a spring right if you have a spring and you put a weight on it at, at one end so at one end is fixed the, on the other end, you have it. Uh, you have it. Wait. So you stretch it. It has a natural position, right? The spring has a natural length, right? And then if you stretch it, you are changing the natural length, right? So then if you let go of the uh, of the uh, uh, weight, uh, whatever the weight is, let go, then it's going to go back and forth, right? So it's going to move from its uh, natural position. Uh, so there is a restoring force on the object, right? Once you, 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 you stretch the spring and let go, there is a restoring force, right? And that, that's what I'm talking about. Let's say the restoring force is F, and you stretch it by an X amount, right? So, uh, so this is equal to, the, let's say the stretch is uh, X, so this is the same as K times X. The force is, a, is, a, is, a, is proportional to the stretch, okay? And uh, this is known as what? Anyone knows from physics? Hooke's law. My point is, there is a relationship between the stretch and how much force is exerted, right? And in any case, uh, my point is, uh, in, in, in applications you have all these quantities like position like speed or velocity 
or uh, force or many other things, uh, time, uh, areas and uh, lengths, all these quantities that you have, uh, you don't just study those quantities, you study relationships between them, right? So time, you cannot talk about position or the speed or velocity without time, right? You usually want to know what's the position at time t, what's the velocity at time t, what's the speed at time t, and so on, right? So uh, notice that uh, if you have a circle of some certain radius r, then the radius uh, is, uh, uh, for each radius, there is a corresponding value of the area, right? And uh, for for each, for any given time, there is a corresponding value of the position function, position, and for each value of time, there is a corresponding value of the velocity, right? And for each value of the stretch, x, there is a corresponding value of the restoring force, f, right? Uh, so, Think of this, all these functions is like an input-output uh, relationship. It's an input-output process because if your input is a radius, then the output is, a, is the area. If your input is time, the output is velocity or position. If your input is x, the, the output is the restoring force. So I, I will think of this uh, relationships as input-output. So think of this uh, relationships. Um, think of this relationships relationships as input output um, process Okay. Um, now, so there are there are so many relationships like this in applications, right? And uh, and we want to study them um, mathematically. So when you try to study certain things mathematically, you have to look at the abstract features of those of those things. So all this. Um, all these quantities are different, right? All, this, all these relationships, uh, they have different meanings in different areas, right? And, um, but all these relationships, they have certain features in common, certain abstract features in common. What is that? Well, so I'm going to now, now just think, uh, generally talk about input-output process, right? So I have an input x, and then the corresponding output is f of x. So f of x is the output. I'm going to think of that the output. And x is the input. So uh, uh, all these uh, functions that I, uh, all these uh, relationships that I told you about, radius, area, uh, time, position, time, velocity, uh, stretch, and uh, uh, destroying force, all these relationships are called functions, okay? And a function, what is a function? It's an input-output process, okay? It's an input-output relationship. And uh, what, 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 what's the, uh, what are the abstract features of these functions? Well, the abstract features is the following. Notice that if, you, if I give you a radius, right? So let's say you are the function, okay? You are a box, okay, you are the function, if I give you the radius value, uh, you spit out the, uh, the, uh, uh, the area value, right? Now, notice that if I give you one radius value, you are not going to give me two different area values, right? Am I making sense? If I give you one, one radius, you wouldn't be giving me two different areas, right? If I give you one specific value of time, you wouldn't give me two different values of the position function, right? Am I making sense? So that's the key feature of all these relationships, that one input leads to one, one exactly one output, okay? Is that making sense? Um, so again, the, if what is a function, well, I'm going to think of that as a process or a box, 
um, so let me make a box here so um, here is a function f okay and um, the function f um, whoops um, so you you if you if you send a if you send a input x to f okay an input x going into f and then f will give you f will give you f will give you a output value which will be denoted by f of x so your input goes so your input goes here your input and then you get the output and then you get the output um, and uh, remember so the uh, key feature of all this relationship input output relationship is that um, one input uh, let me say it this way uh, each input each input leads to exactly exactly one output and that's the key feature okay so a function is a input output process where each input leads to exactly one output okay so what I'm saying is that suppose that you I gave you an input X but then you gave me two different outputs. Let's say you gave me a, a, an output y1 and another output y2. Okay, then it's not a function. Am I making sense? Um, so, one input x gives you exactly one output y. Okay. One input x gives you exactly one output y. Now, uh, the input values, right? given any function it has it has a set of valid inputs right suppose you are studying a uh, object let's say we are you are going from here to columbus we are studying your motion okay now if i am studying your motion uh, let's say you started at time uh, 12 o'clock and then you reach there at uh, 2 p.m. right in two hours so you're so you, you you started at zero hour let's say you went there after you, you reached there after two hours so what are the valid uh, values of time if I am studying your motion well the valid values of time if I'm studying your motion is that two hour interval okay so given any time you have a function there is a collection of valid inputs okay and that's called the domain so here's the domain and a domain is the valid valid input it's the collection of valid inputs okay and uh, what's the uh, what's the collection of output values the collection of output values that's called the range that's called the range values the range of a function it's called the uh, output of out, is the collection of output values I am going to denote the range of a fun if I if I am denoting the function by f I am going to denote the range by rf okay so and if I am denoting a function by f I am going to denote the domain by df is everybody okay with that so df would mean the domain of f is the collection of valid inputs and the range of f is the collection of uh, it's the collection of uh, 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 of all output values is everybody okay with that yeah yeah domain so again fun think of a function as an input output relationship each input leads to exactly one output okay it can it, one input cannot give you two different outputs okay and um, so there is a valid collect there is a collection of valid inputs and that's called the domain of f 
it's going to depend on each function, what the function is. Okay. For example, if, uh, like I said, if you suppose that I, you are going from here to Columbus and you start at zero hour, you, you reach there after two hours and I am studying your motion only. So I'm studying your position. So at any time between zero and two hours, you have a position. And so in that case, what are the valid values of time? The valid values of time would be zero and between zero and two. Because I am only concentrating on your motion position at, at, in that time interval. I don't care about what happens for other times. Is that making sense? So in that case, the valid values would be, would be uh, all the times between 0 and 2. I'm going to talk about more examples of functions in a bit. Uh, but uh, this is all you need to remember, input-output relationship. Each input gives you exactly one output. Okay? Now, examples. Uh, so let's see examples. Um, example of functions. Now, if you have only finitely many input values, if you have only finitely many input values, well, how would you specify the function? Well, you can just write down the value of the, the, uh, the value of each output corresponding to each input, right? Because I have only finitely many input values. So if, if you have a function where, where you have only finitely many input values, then you can just specify the function by writing down each input and the corresponding output, right? So here's a, here's a function like that. So let's say I have the input value represented by x, output value represented by f of x, and uh, I am going to... Uh, 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 I am going to uh, say, let's say the input, va the valid input values are 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Okay, so these are the valid input values. And, um, and the, so because I have only 5 input values, whatever the function, you know, the, the function that I, I'm giving you, it might not have a specific meaning to you, right? Uh, for any applications, but I'm just trying to give you an abstract example here. So these are the only valid inputs, and the corresponding output values are given by, let's say, the following. It's given by 0, 1, 2, 0, 1. Okay, now my question to you, is that a valid function? Does it satisfy my, my one input leads to one output? Does it satisfy that? Yeah, because if you look at each number on the left, it, it gives you exactly one output. It doesn't give you two different outputs, right? On the other hand, so this is, a, on the other hand, consider this other function, uh, x and g of x, let's say. So g of x is the output value. So again, I have, say, 0, um, uh, zero um, 4, 1, 2, 3, and 4, and the values are given by, let's say, 0, 1, uh, 2, 0, 1, negative 1 here. So what's wrong with this? What's wrong with this? Yeah, what happens here is that I'm saying that, the, you see, the number 4, the number 4 is, uh, the number 4 as an input it, it goes to two different outputs, right? One is negative one, the other one is one. So the, uh, the input four leads you to two different outputs. So this is not a function. So g is not a function. g is not a function. g is not a function. This guy, however, is a function. Everybody's okay with that? Notice that I said Every input leads to exactly one output. However, one single output may correspond to two different inputs, right? Notice that I have zero, zero here, zero here, right? So the same output corresponds to, corresponds to two different inputs, right? That's valid. All I'm saying, one input leads to exactly one output, but one output may as maybe 
may, may correspond to two different inputs, okay? So let me write that, emphasize that again. Um, so what I'm saying is, again, each input, each input leads to exactly, exactly one output, but a, 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 an, an output may correspond may correspond to uh, more than one more than one input okay now in calculus usually we don't study fi uh, functions with finite domain okay uh, so Let's look at uh, examples, more, uh, more like the ones that we're going to use. Uh, so, uh, sometimes, so if the domain of a function is not finite, then you cannot write out each input and corresponding output, right? In a table, it's not possible because you have infinitely many uh, uh, input values. So in that case, how would you write down the function? Well, then you either describe the function or you write down the function uh, as a formula. So, for example, if I write the function f of x is equal to x squared, what am I saying? I am saying that if the input value is x, if the input value is x, then the output value is the square of x. Right? If the input value is x, then the then the output value is the square of the input, right? How do you get the uh, well, what's the process? Well, square the input, right? You square the input. So that's the uh, uh, that's a that's a function. Now, what are the uh, usually whenever whenever you define a function, you have to specify the domain. But often in calculus, we don't specify the domain. Why? Well, we agree that if the domain is not specified then the domain is the collection of all real numbers for which the definition of the function makes sense. So if I look at this definition of f, right, for what real numbers x will this definition make sense? Well, you, you ask yourself, hey, can I square any real number? The answer is yes, I can square any real number, right? And therefore, x could be any real number in this case. So in this case, I would say that the domain of f, uh, sorry, I, I want to use the uh, uppercase d. Domain of f, in this case, I would say all real numbers. Again, sometimes we will specify the domain, but if the domain is not specified, you assume that the domain of the function is the collection of all real numbers for which the definition makes sense. Okay, uh, compare that with the with the example of g of x, which is given by root x. So what are we doing here? This function is basically the process where the if you are given an input x, you are taking the square root of that input, right? That's what this function does. The output is the root of the input, right? And in this case, uh, in this case, what would I take the domain to be? Zero to infinity, because now the definition of G does not make sense if X is negative, right? Does not make sense because uh, the square root of a negative number is not a real number, right? Yeah. So. Uh, in this case, we, we will say that the domain of G is the all numbers between uh, from zero to infinity. Okay, is everybody okay with that? Um, okay. Um, I, I am going to stop here and take a break. Okay. Um, the uh, 
I'm going to start with another example here. Uh, another example of a function. Uh, let's say that I have uh, the function f of x, uh, which is given by uh, root of x minus 2. So what is this function doing? It takes an input, right? And then that input is converted to the root of uh, the input minus 2, right? So basically, how, what is the function doing here? The function is doing the following, whatever the, in order to get the output, in order to obtain the output, uh, the function is basically doing the following. Uh, it, it is subtracting from the input. So it takes the input, and then it subtracts 2 from the input, and then it takes the square root of the result, right? That's what this function does, right? In order to get the output. Input minus the 2, and then you take the root, you get the output. And, so, and what's the domain in this case? What's the domain of this function? Well, it's a collection of all values of x for which uh, it makes sense. And, uh, and we know that inside the square root, you cannot have negative. So, so uh, you want x minus 2 to be what? We want x minus 2 to be non-negative, right? So for then, what do I get for x then? x has to be larger than 2. So what's the domain? The domain is all real numbers from 2 to infinity. Is everybody okay with that? The domain is all real numbers from 2 to infinity. Any questions on that? Everybody's okay? All right, so now, uh, I mean, let me do the uh, an, uh, another example here. So instead of this example, let's take the uh, example of the function g of x, which is the root of 4 minus x. What's going to happen now? Once again, if you have the input x, the input x is leading us to the output 4 minus x, the root of that. And again, uh, how are we getting the output? Well, the function does the following. It t if you give the function the input x, it is subtracting the input from the 4, and then it's taking the root. And uh, in this case, what's the domain? What's the domain of g? Well, in order to find the domain, you need to uh, realize that inside the square root, I cannot have negative. So uh, 4, minus hack, 4 minus x needs to be non-negative, but that implies that 4 is larger than x. And that implies x is what? Less than 4. So then our domain is all real numbers below 4. All real numbers below 4. Everybody is okay with that? Yeah. Closed bracket? Yeah, that's what I have, right? Yeah. Uh, my, uh, my bracket might not be... <laughs> Sorry. Looking like a bracket, but uh, it is a bracket, yeah. It's an artistic bracket. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's look at another example. Suppose that I have uh, the function which is called h, and h evaluated at an input x is given by. Uh, let's say 1 over uh, x squared minus x minus 2. Okay? And um, again, the question is then, what's the domain? So I want to know the domain of this function. How do I determine that? Well, I need to know for what values of x uh, will this uh, fraction make sense, right? The denominator of the fraction is given by x squared minus x mi uh, minus 2. So the question is, for what values of x will this fraction make sense? Well, the fraction makes sense as long as you don't get 0 in the denominator, right? So the domain would be all real numbers, all values of x 
except for the ones where the denominator is zero. Okay? So from all the real numbers, you have to exclude the values uh, for which you get zero in the denominator. So how do we do that? Well, figure out where the denominator is zero. Let's figure, figure that out. So x squared minus x minus two, when will this be zero? Well, can I factor that out? What is that? x minus 2, x plus 1, and then x is 2, or x is negative 1. So what's the domain then? Well, if x is 2, or if x is negative 1, I get a 0 in the denominator, so I have to exclude these two values from the domain. So the domain would be uh, all real numbers, and from the real numbers, uh, I have to get rid of this symbol that I have slash black backslash. It means get rid of from get rid of the numbers uh, a negative one and two. So if if you get rid of the numbers negative one and two from all the real numbers, you you end up with the domain. In other words, in interval notation, what's the what, what, how would I write that down? I have. Yeah, so give me one second to make a real number line here, just to make sure you get this. Let's say I have the number negative 1 here, I have the number 2 here. The domain is all real numbers except for these two, right? I have to exclude negative 1 and 2. So what's the domain? So you, you come from negative infinity up to negative 1. You don't include negative 1, so you, you use the parenthesis. And then, you go from negative 1 up to 2, again you don't include one and two, uh, negative 1 and 2, and then you go from 2 to infinity and you don't include 2, right? So this means that all real numbers except negative 1 and 2. All real numbers except negative 1 and 2, yeah. Yeah. Oops. Right there? Uh, any questions on that, on finding the domain here? When I give you an exam on this topic, uh, one of the first questions would be find the domain of this function and that function. Any questions? Uh, go down. Yeah. <coughs> <laughs> so whenever you have a ratio of uh, uh, whenever you have a function given by a ratio uh, you need to determine where the denominator vanishes and then you have to exclude them from the real numbers to determine the domain okay. let's look at another function given by a ratio. Let's say I have the function g of x and the function is given by x squared minus 4 divided by x minus 2. Uh, what's the domain in that, in that case? Well it's really pretty clear. I don't really have to do very, many, very much work here because the domain of g is basically given by all real numbers except all real numbers except two. So how do I write that in uh, interval notation? So if if this number represents two, let's say, I have to exclude two from the domain. So the domain would be all the numbers from negative infinity up to two, excluding two together with all real numbers above 2, excluding 2, right? That's how I'm going to write it. Everybody is okay? Um, now, a little bit more difficult example. Um, and this is probably uh, the hardest example you would find. Um, Let's uh, look at the function uh, um, f of x 
and it's given by the root of 9 minus x squared no actually I'm going to leave that for you uh, let's say x squared minus 9 okay again uh, what I need to understand here is what's the domain of this function oops so what's the domain of f how would I determine that once again I have a even root right which means that inside the even root I don't want to have negative right so that means that uh, I uh, uh, this will this definition makes sense as long as x squared minus 9 is what non-negative okay then I could say what um, then I could say that x squared is larger or equal to 9 okay um, by the way in calculus whenever we, uh, uh, if we if you have maybe uh, let me remind you uh, that if I have x squared and if I take the square root of x squared I am gonna get no I'm going to get just a absolute value of x the, if I write root of something it's always the positive root so if I write positive uh, if I write the root of 9 I'm going to say this is just 3 however if I want the negative root of 9 then I'm going to put a negative here and say it's negative root three, negative root of 9 okay so here uh, I am going to take the root of both sides now the root of both sides and on the left side I get absolute value of x the reason I write absolute value of x is because I don't know whether x is positive or negative and, on the, uh, and here I get 3 so the question is for what values of x is the absolute value of x greater than 3 right now here's the number line oops yeah let's think about this negative 3 here and positive 3 here and remember absolute value of x represents what is the distance from 0 to x right absolute value of x is the distance from 0 to x we're saying the distance between 0 and x is greater than 3 right so x will be where x would be either here or x could be here x cannot be between negative 3 and 3 because if x is between negative 3 and 3 then the, the distance from the origin is smaller than 3 right if x is between negative 3 and 3 then the distance from the origin he does this is the origin uh, between uh, the distance from the origin to x would be less than 3 so then I know that x would be where x would be up to negative 3 or x would be bigger than 3 right x would be either less than negative 3 or x would be bigger than positive 3 is everybody okay with that everybody okay all right so now I'm gonna leave it for you as an exercise exercise uh, come up with the domain of find domain of uh, the function g of x which is given by the root of 9 minus x squared you might you might be able to guess what that answer is but you should go through the steps that uh, the way I did and see what you get yeah a little bit yeah okay so uh, to do that exercise on your own see if you can do that okay to, to, um, to make sure that you can go over the same steps that I did <coughs> uh, 
Um, so these are all the examples that I wanted to do on finding domains, and you know I'll I'll be assigning some homeworks uh, before you leave today. Um, okay. So the next topic that I have is we will we will see what what do we mean by the graph of the function. Okay? So let me know if you're done writing it down. Where? For for the exercise? Yeah. All real numbers except three? Yeah. No, three is a three for three it makes sense, right? If three if you replace x by three you get zero. Oh. All real numbers. All real numbers up to three? Yeah, up to three. No, that's incorrect. You have to go through what I go through the steps that I did. Um, and understand what we did here. Um, okay, so so now I want to s talk about the uh, the graph of a graph of a function. Okay, the graph graph of a function. So what do we mean by the graph of a function? Uh, let's uh, let let f of x be a function uh, if I have a function f remember a function is an input output process x so you have an input x it gives you an output represented by f of x so what I'm going to do is that you pair up each input uh, with the corresponding output. So pair up each input with the corresponding output. You get a point, right? Each input paired up with the corresponding output. And the input will go over the domain of the function, right? So, so for every valid input, you do that. For every valid input, you pair up the input with the corresponding output. Then you, ha you, you get a collection of inputs, right? You get a collection of pairs, right? And uh, that collection of pairs you can plot in the plane, right? Everybody's making sense? Is that making sense? So each input pair it up with the corresponding output, you get a point, right? And think about all the points you can obtain in this way for all the valid inputs and then you plot them, uh, you get the graph of the function. So that's what we mean by the graph of the, the graph of the function. Let me give you an ex a specific example. Uh, let's uh, uh, let's uh, look at the function that I had, uh, the finite function case. L let's look at that first. Let's say I have the function x, function f of x, where it said the domain is uh, finite. The domain is 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And then the function values are given by 0, 1, 2, 0, 1. This is a valid function. What's the, do what's the graph of that? Well, remember, we are going to pair up each input with the corresponding output. Pair up each input with the corresponding output. Uh, and and you're, you're going to plot them. So. Let's uh, plot them in the xy plane. Um, okay, so let's plot. Let's say uh, my unit length is here: one, two, uh, three, and four, and five, and so on. And my unit length here is like this. Whoa. Okay, so what's the point zero zero? Well, the point zero zero is right here, right? Let me use red. So point zero zero is right here. Where is the point one one? One one would be right here, right? Where is the point two two? Two two would be right there. Where is the point three zero? Three zero is right here. Where is the point four one? Four one is right here, right? So my the graph of this function is just five points. It's a discrete set of points. 
the graph of this function is just five points, okay? Everybody's okay? All right. Now, again, these are not the functions that we, you, we study in calculus. We want to uh, look at uh, the uh, functions defined on intervals. Those are more interesting for us. So here, is a, here is a function. Let's say f of x is uh, x squared. Or let's say f of x is, uh, uh, is, uh, is just x for now. Well, Let's make it 2x. Um, so what is this function doing? Well, it, whatever the input is, uh, the output is obtained by multiplying the input with, by 2, right? Multiply the input by 2, you get the output. And what's the domain of this function? <laughs> domain of this function is clearly all real numbers, right? And what's the, gra oops, what's the graph of this function? Uh, I am going to make my coordinates play, uh, axis first. Okay. Uh, I want to draw the graph of this. I'm pretty sure you all know this, but I'm going to... Uh, uh, do that anyway. So what is the uh, what is the graph of this function? The graph of this function would be it would be the collection of all points like like what? Well, each input value x will be paired up with the output value. Oh, the output value is what? So each input value would be paired up with the output value two x, and then uh, and for and this will be done for every single every single real number because every single real number is in the domain so for each x pair up x with 2x you get a point and plot that point now there are so many points to plot right um, but uh, we're gonna plot some of them and then we will see uh, how to uh, get them um, well, we already know it's a line right so we, we saw, talked about the uh, uh, basically, uh, the graph of this function means the graph of the equation y equals to 2x, right? The graph of this function is the same as the graph of the equation y equals to 2x. Okay? So in general, the graph of a function f is the same as the graph of the equation y is f of x. Okay? So... Uh, so we let's plot some points. Just uh, uh, so uh, if x is zero, what is uh, uh, what is the value of the function? Zero. So I get the point zero zero. If x is one, if x is one, what's the value of the function? Two. two. Let's say two is right here. Uh, if x is uh, two, what's the value of the function? Four. So let's say four would be right here. And I can see that what what, what I get, I basically get this line right and of course the line will extend on the negative side as well everybody's okay with that so that's the graph of y equals to 2x uh, well uh, if x is 0 y is 0 right if if x is 0 y is 0 if x is 1 y is 2 if x is uh, well, we, you know, we already know this is the line. Uh, it's in the it's in the it's in the uh, slope intercept form, right? Two is the slope. What's the intercept? Zero, right? P plus b, right? M x plus b, b is zero. So the intercept is zero. So I know that this is a straight line going through the origin with slope two, right? And you know, uh, since I know it's a line, all I have to do is really plot two points and add them, right? Plot two points and add them. So that's the graph of this uh, this function here. Is everybody okay with that? Um, let me do one more example of graphs. So if I have the function f of x equals to x squared, um, that's denote let's denote the output by y. If I denote the output by y, I get y equals to x squared. 
and the, uh, the uh, graph of this function is the same as the graph of the equation y equals to x squared. What's the graph of that equation? It's a parabola, right? Okay, so in this case, uh, let's pick this much to be 1 and uh, this much to be 1 then. Uh, when x is uh, 0, y is 0. When x is 1, y is 1. When x is negative 1, y is positive 1 as well, right? When x is, uh, when x is 2, this is 1, this is 2. When x is 2, what is y? 4. So where would, would I get 4? Right here, right? And then when x is negative 2, y would be uh, 4 as well, right? So this height here is 4. And uh, so then I'm going to add them, connect the points in a curve, Okay, so that's the that's the graph. Uh, in this case, the domain is all real numbers, so the graph goes on forever, right? Okay, so that's the graph of the function x squared. Um, okay, so so generally speaking, then uh, just to, to recap, uh, what we said is that if I have a uh, function uh, the uh, graph graph of a function f of x simply means that uh, you pair up every input with the corresponding output and then you look at all possible points like this as x varies over the domain of the function you get the and you plot them you get the graph so generally speaking, you get something like this. Um, uh, so let's say uh, I have a uh, I have a graph like this. So uh, this is the graph of the function f of x. So what are we doing in order to get the graph of the function? We are simply uh, for each value of x, for each value of x, I am, I am taking, I, I am plotting a point where the coordinates of the point is what? First coordinate is x, the second coordinate is the value of the function at x, right? And the height here then is what? What's the height here? The height here is f of x, right? The height here is f of x. So for each input x, you plot x on the, uh, you plot the input value on the x-axis, then the output value is, the height is the output value, so f of x is the height of the point. So that's, that's what you get. Everybody's okay with that? That's what we mean by the, by the graph of the function, yes? Yeah. Right here? Oh, oh down? Yeah. Uh, are we clear w with uh, what, uh, what we mean by uh, graphs of functions? I know you, most of you have seen graphs of functions and all that. It might be a little bit boring for you, but I want to go over uh, all the uh, reviews that I think we'll, we're going to need in the course. Um, okay, are you are you done writing it down? Okay.
All right, so uh, I want to do an example with functions. Uh, say I have a function f of x, and I the function is given by 2x squared minus 5x plus 1. So what are you doing here? The function is basically doing the following, right? If you give the function the input x, it is squaring x, multiplying that by 2, then it's subtracting 5 times the input, and then it's adding 1, right? In any case, uh, that's the function, so what would be the value of the function when x is 1? When x is 1, what do I get? 2 minus a 5 plus 1, what is that? Negative 2, right? Okay, what is uh, f of negative 3? Well, I'm going to plug in negative 3, right? Negative 3 squared minus 5 times negative 3 plus 1. What is that? You get 9 times 2, so that's 18, right? 18 plus 15 plus 1. What is that? Uh, 34. Everybody's okay? Okay, so uh, what is f of 0? That's the easy one, right? 1. Uh, what is uh, f of... What is f of a? Yeah, just replace uh, x by a, right? So you get 2a squared minus 5a plus 1. Uh, what is f of, people sometimes get confused about this, f of 3x. What is f of 3x? Because they see x in the definition of f, and then they see 3x, they get sometimes confused. But when you look at the definition of f, f of x is 2x squared minus 5x plus 1. Think of that following. If x is the input, then you are, what are you doing to the input? So when you, when you have the input to be 3x, you replace the input x by 3x okay, everywhere. So, so this would be 2 times 3x squared minus 5 times 3x uh, plus 1. Okay, and uh, you should pay attention to this because I see a lot of a lot of the times people make mistakes with this. They don't uh, they don't replace x everywhere by 3x. Okay. So make sure you replace x by 3x everywhere you see x. And then what is that? Uh, 9, 18x squared, right? 18x squared minus 15x uh, plus 1. Okay? So that's the value there. Oh, you can leave it that way. That's fine. Uh, <coughs> what is f of root x, it'll be, well, uh, you, you have the definition in front of you, right? It's 2 times root x squared, right? What was the next one? Minus 5x? So minus 5 times root x, right? Plus 1. So what do I get? 2x minus 5 root x plus 1. Is that okay? Uh, let's do one more like this. Uh, what if I replace x by x plus 2? Then I get 2 times x plus 2 squared minus 5 times x plus 2 plus 1, right? And I have a little bit of work. If I want to simplify this, I have to square that. So this would be 2 times what? x plus 2 squared is what? x squared plus 4x plus 4 minus 5x minus 10 plus 1. What did I do? I, I multiplied x plus 2 times x plus 2, right? x plus 2 times x plus 2. Uh, what is right? 4x plus 4, yeah, that's correct. Um, okay, so what do I get? See, if I simplify, I get 2x squared 
you realize that I get an 8x and then I have a minus 5x. So what, what would that be? Well, let me write it down. Okay, 8x plus 8 minus 5x minus 10 plus 1. So this would be 2x squared. You have to collect the like terms. 8x minus 5x is what? 3x. 8 minus 10 plus 1. So 9 minus 10. That's negative 1. Okay. Is that okay? Okay. A little bit different now. Let's say I want to know what is f of what is f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. Let's say I want to know the value of this ratio. f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h. Let's see what that is. Um, what is f of x plus h? Well, you have the f of x in front of you, right? What should I do? I replace x by x plus h, right? So what do I get? I get 2 times x plus h squared minus, what is that, 5 times x plus h, and then is that plus 1? So this is what? This is f of x plus h, right? And then I have to subtract what? f of x. So f of x is as it is, 2x squared minus 5x plus 1. And then in the denominator, I have h. Uh, is everybody okay with what I wrote? All right, so now we have to, it's just algebra now, right? So you have to uh, simplify things out. So in the numerator, in the first uh, brackets, uh, 2 times x plus h squared. So if I multiply x plus h and x plus h, right, what do I get? x squared plus 2, ti two times x h plus h squared, right? And here I get negative 5x, negative 5h plus a 1 and then I have negative I'm going to uh, get rid of the uh, brackets in the in the second uh, the second two brackets so I get negative 2x squared right plus 5x minus 1 right I have to distribute the negative you guys are okay with that okay I have to divide by what H Okay, what's next? Multiply out by 2, you get 2x squared plus 4xh plus 2h squared minus 5x minus 5h plus 1 minus 2x squared plus 5x minus 1. Okay, what are the things that cancel out? 2x squared cancels out the 2x squared here. Minus 5x and plus 5x. 1 and minus 1. Uh, is that it? Okay, so then what do I get? I get 4xh plus 2h squared divided by h and I can factor out an h now I get 4x plus 2h oh there was a negative 5h um, Well, I'm going to use the eraser here. Um, okay, I, I forgot negative 5h here. And then, so I would get what? Negative 5 here. And then I have h here. Uh, Everybody is uh, okay with what I have. And h cancels out now.
we factored h from the numerator right in the numerator yeah but now we cancel them out right so I get I get uh, 4x plus 2h minus 5 right so that's the uh, that's the final answer so that ratio simplifies to all the way this everybody is uh, okay with that um, I am going to do one more example like this because this ratio that I have you have to do that in one of your homework but you have to do it some uh, with the root function as well so I'm going to do an example with the root function here suppose that I have the function f of x is root of x uh, again I want to know what is f of x plus h minus f of x divided by h what is that ratio this is called the difference quotient there is a name for this quotient that I, we are looking at this is known as this is known as a uh, difference quotient quotient okay how do I evaluate that well what is f of x plus h somebody what is f of x plus h what is f of x plus h root of x plus h you replace x by x plus h minus f of x is just root x divided by h now how do I simplify that how would I simplify oh well uh, I think it's a little bit misleading to say simplify uh, what I want to do is I want to get rid of the h in the denominator okay later on in in other places you see why I, I want to get rid of that age okay in other problems but how do I get rid of that age well uh, not square multiply multiply by no, so how do I uh, I want to get rid of the age here right I don't have an age in the numerator as a factor right if I want to get rid of the age in the denominator I need a factor of age in the numerator right so how would I get that? Say it again. You cannot get rid of the axis. That's not a valid algebra. That is, uh, root of x plus h is not the same as root of x plus root of h. Okay. By what? multiply by the conjugate right remember we saw a trick in the algebra review which was you multiply and divide by the conjugate that is you rationalize rationalize the numerator you plus instead of a minus you get a plus and then the same quantity in the denominator so you rationalize and now if you multiply out the numerators what do you get well I am going to do the difficult computation here I'm going to multiply the denominators and I'll let you multiply the numerators what do you get in the numerator you get exactly x plus h minus x if you multiply out you'll see that that's what you get but uh, um, remember uh, I can think of this as a minus b times a plus b right a minus b times a plus b and then I have a formula for that right a minus b a plus b which is a squared minus b squared and so this you, you basically uh, square you basically square the this guy minus the square of the other one uh, or if you don't like that you can just multiply out foil and and get you'd get the same answer so you get x plus h minus x and then you have h times 
the root of x plus h plus uh, root of x and then this is equal to h over h times root of x plus h plus root of x and now you can cancel out the h's and finally you get this Uh, let me tell you why we get rid of H. Uh, you see at the beginning the way H is, right? At the beginning the ratio, if I plug in, uh, if I replace H by 0, what do I get? If I replace H by 0 here, I get what? I get 0, right? If I replace H by 0, I get root X minus root X, 0. Replace H by 0, so I get 0 divided by 0. Now, let's see after our computation, what do I get when I replace h by 0? What do I get now? 1 divided by root x plus root x, which is not 0 anymore, right? So, and you will see later when we talk about limits, this is what we need to do to come up with the limit of this, of this quantity. Yeah. Oh. Right here? Okay. Down? You tell me when to stop. All right, um, uh, I think uh, I, I, was, I was thinking about giving you an, giving you, giving you an exam next week, um, which will be like the, the first exam, but if I give you the exam at the end of, the ne at the end of next week, it will be a big exam. Because by the, by the, by the time on Thursday, we, will, we probably will be covering a lot. So I, it might be a better idea to, so this would be a one hour exam, like 50 minutes exam that I, I had in mind, but I was thinking that maybe we can split the first exam into two parts, and one part on Monday and then the other part on Friday, half an hour each. That way, you don't have to study a lot at the same time, okay? So on Monday, I want to give you an exam on all the homeworks that I assigned so far which are pretty much the algebra and the and the Does that sound good? So about, you're gonna have the first part of the exam, half an hour, and you start at 12 and you go up to 12. And then on Friday, whatever we cover by the Wednesday, we will have that on Friday, okay? Is everybody clear on what I said, yeah? It's not going to be covered on Monday, but it will be covered on Friday. So whatever I do between, uh, after the re trig review handouts, uh, whatever I'm covering up until Wednesday, that will be on your Friday exam. Okay. All right, so uh, I wanna do more examples to, uh, for the rest of the time. Um, Let's look at uh, the following example. Uh, let's say I have the function f of x, which is x squared minus 4 divided by x minus 2. Uh, I want to know what's the graph of this function, okay? What's the graph? Now, before I draw the graph, one thing you want to realize is that, is that this function that I have, uh, I can factor out the numerator as x minus 2, x plus 2, and once I do that, then I can cancel out x minus 2, and I get x plus 2. So does that mean, does that mean that this function here is the same as this function here? There's only one difference. 
Uh, notice that when x is 2, the second function is defined, it is 4. When x is 2, the first function is undefined, you get 0 divided by 0. Okay? Otherwise, you see, the, the step that I did here, right, this step here, this is only valid when x minus 2, when x, if x is not 2. So these two functions are the same except when x is 2. So the graph of the function f is the same as the graph of x plus 2 except when x is 2, my function f is undefined, okay? So what would be the graph? Yes. So uh, the graph of x plus 2, let's say 2 is here and negative 2 is here. So I know that the, my straight line would be going through these two, right? Uh, and uh, let's say here is a... Uh, here is 1, here is 2. At 2, the value of the function is what? 4, right? x plus 2 is 4. So right here, I have a hole. So the, the straight line, the entire straight line is the graph of x plus 2. But the graph of f of x, the graph of f of x is, uh, is the straight line with the hole at 2. Okay, so this is where 2 is. This is where 4 is. Oh boy. This is where 4 is. Are we okay with that? The graph of this function f is the straight line x plus 2 with the hole. Okay? With the hole at, at 2. Um, you guys have seen piecewise defined functions before? Piecewise defined functions? Uh, piecewise. Piecewise defined functions. Uh, for example, an example of that is if I have a function f of x, let's say I define it as uh, 1 minus x, uh, where x is less than or equal to negative 1, and it is x squared if x is larger than 1. A piecewise defined function means that the, the, the formula for the function uh, is, uh, the function is defined by more than one formula, according as uh, the uh, values of the uh, uh, of the uh, the values of the inputs so when when the when the when the value of the input is less than negative 1 there is a formula for f and the formula for f when the uh, input is greater than 1 is different so that's why it's called piecewise defined function now what's the graph of this function what would be the graph of this function? Anyone knows? How would you draw the graph of this function? Well, uh, on the right, so you have, on, on the, on the uh, x-axis, you have 1, right? On the right side of 1, the function is given by the parabola. So you take the graph of the parabola, uh, which is on the right side of 1, right? Am I making sense? And then, uh, on the left side of 1, uh, on the... Uh, uh, oh, this is this is negative one. Okay, this is negative one. Sorry. Uh, on the uh, on, so on the left side of negative one, you take the graph of one minus x. So let's let's do that. Um, Okay, so um, here, where is negative 1? Let's pick a, uh, let's say half of that here is 1. I don't know why it does that, okay. And so, 
So this is uh, uh, negative 2 here, a uh, negative, uh, no this is negative 2, so this will be negative 1 here. So this is negative 1, okay? And uh, on the right side of negative 1, I want the graph to be the parabola, right? So let's draw the parabola between negative 1 to infinity. When, neg when x is negative 1, what's the value of the function? The value of the function is given by what? Uh, um, it's parabola, right? And when x is exactly... No, sorry, when x is exactly negative 1, the value of the function is what? 1 minus minus 1, which is 2. So which would be uh, right here. Now, when x is 0, what's the value of the function? When x is 0, it's given by the parabola, right? When x is larger than negative 1, it's like x squared, right? So when x is 0, the value is 0. And it's just a parabola then after that, right? So when x is 1, when x is 1, you get this point, 1, 1, right? So after that, you basically get the parabola. Uh, oops, sorry, 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 sorry. I have a mistake here. Notice that uh, if, uh, on the parabola, when x is negative 1, on the parabola I get, I get positive 1 here, right? So I get this parabola here, this part of the parabola, when x is bigger than negative 1. When x is less than negative 1, I get the line, and the line is what? 1 minus x. So 1 minus x, that straight line is what? Uh, when um, that straight line when x is a negative 1, we got 2. We, I need another point, right? When x is negative 2, what do I get? What is my definition of that? When x is negative 2, I get 3, right? So I get, when x is negative 2, I get 3, which would be right here. So I get the straight line like this. So the graph of this piecewise defined function is given by these two parts. You guys agree with that or not? So I look at the graph of the parabola, I take the part of the parabola where x is greater than negative 1, and then I take part of the straight line which is uh, le where x is less than negative 1. One thing, you could do, one thing I could have done is that I could have drawn both, both the parabola and the straight line, and then I delete, delete the part of the straight line to the right of negative 1, and I delete the part of the parabola to the left of negative 1, right? That's, that's how I obtain, obtain this. Is everybody uh, okay with what I, what I did? Everybody's okay? All right. Um, I think I'm going to end here. Um, so uh, on Monday, we will continue. This. So this pretty much finishes section... 1.1 and a most of 1.2 okay uh, don't go yet I'm gonna give you the homework um, you guys all have the Stewart's textbook okay those of you who came from Nor uh, uh, Illinois you guys use Stewart's text yeah it's the seventh edition right it's the seventh edition. Yeah. Uh, some of you don't have that text yet. No. You might want to copy it from him. Uh, but if you don't have the text, wait, wait for a second after the class. I'm going. I have some loose leaf. I have a text loose leaf. You can copy the uh, exercises from there. So wait till. Wait till. Uh, don't don't leave it. Okay, section 1.1, 1 .1, uh, the homework is the following. Uh, 1, 2, 3, uh, 7, 9. Okay, 1, 2, 3, 7, 9. And then uh, 27, 29. Uh, and 31 to 49. Uh, actually, yeah, 39 to 50, uh, 51 odd. 
uh, th 31, let me say that again, okay? I'm sorry. You we can actually just say from 27 to 51 odd. 27 to 51 odd. Odd numbered only. 51. Odd numbered only, okay? Good. That's it. So this is section 1-1. One, one. Once again, let me say that again. 1, 2, 3, 7, 9. 1, 2, 3, 7, 9. And then 27 up to 51 odd. Okay? That's it. Uh, these are the ones I guess you are missing them. So these are the only two I gave yesterday. Okay. Yeah. Yesterday or the, the day before I forgot? Should be yesterday. Yeah. Yesterday, yeah. Thank you.